It's a quadratic equation, but fortunately, there's no linear term. I have zero equals, zero plus. Let me write it down. In this case, I have zero equals zero plus v initial times time plus one half times, what's the acceleration in the y direction? I was calling up positive, so this is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. And I'm completely running out of space here, times t squared. I want to solve this for time. How do you do that? You don't even need the quadratic equation. Sometimes you need the quadratic equation, but here I'm okay. Let me factor out time. Zero equals time times v initial plus one half times minus 9.8 meters per second squared times time. And I've got one more parenthesis I have to match up. <laughs> this one was really kind of unnecessary. There's an equation. It's time times something equals zero. If time times something equals to zero, there's only two possibilities. Either time equals zero or something equals zero. Time equals to zero, that's a correct solution to this equation. Remember, this equation was when is the object at height equals to zero, and the answer is at time equals to zero. I knew that. But there's another answer, when this is equal to zero. And let's be careful. This is really viy. Viy plus one half, I know what that is. Let me just solve this little internal equation. If this equals to zero, I get Viy divided by one half. I should just be calling this g, and that's equal to time. Formula, time equals, I know Viy, I know what g is. So I know how long it takes, but that wasn't the question I was after. I wanted to know the range, but I'm all set. I know the time and the range. I go back to my x formula. x final range equals x initial plus v initial in the x direction times time. Let me plug in the formula that I just got for time. v i y divided by g over 2. So there's a nice, simple looking formula. It's equal to v i x v i y times 2 divided by g. And that's v cosine theta. And that's v sine theta, so I can write it like so. Let me put the 2 upstairs, because it's in the denominator of the downstairs. Here's the range formula. So if I tell you what theta is and what the initial speed is, a nice convenient formula to find the range. It's a handy formula to have, but it's a little word of warning. Remember that this is only the range if you start and end at the same height. There'll be lots of problems where you start and end at different heights, and then you can't use this formula. Let me make one last little simplification here so we can sort of stare at this formula. It's a lot of good physics already just in this first formula we've derived. Sine theta, cos theta times 2. There's a trig identity. That's the same thing as sine of 2 theta. Range is equal to v squared over g sine of 2 theta. That means that the faster you launch, the farther you're going to go. Makes sense. What about the angular dependence? As you launch at different angles, what does that tell you about how far it's going to get? If theta equals to 0, it just plows right into the ground and you don't get anywhere. If you launch straight up, theta is 90, 2 theta is 180, the sine of 180 is 0. You launch straight up, it goes straight back down, it doesn't go forward. Remember, this is the x motion. What's the optimal? The optimal is when the sine is 1. That's the biggest the sine of anything can ever be. That would be when 2 theta is 90 degrees, or theta is 45 degrees. So that's the best you can ever do if you want this thing to fire as far as possible. Pick 45 degrees. Let me make a little comment about the real world here. I, I tend, like all physicists, to get into my physics world where there's no friction and life is simple. In the real world, there is some air friction. And what does that do? Well, it complicates the story. You see, we no longer just have an acceleration that's down. We now also have a frictional force, which makes an acceleration that's countering the motion. So the friction's acceleration is always changing in direction. It's a very difficult problem to solve. You need really a computer to solve numerically. We've got the equations. Acceleration tells me change in velocity with time, so I can figure out velocity. 
There's no simple formula. Basically, if you've got air friction, well, as you can imagine, it won't get as far. We're not really going to worry about that too much in this course. From time to time, we will investigate questions of friction coming up. What have we done? We have solved, essentially, all two-dimensional physics problems with constant acceleration. I've only done one or two specific examples, but you've got the equations. You can solve them yourself. Any problem I give you, any question that I ask, you're all set up to solve it. What about three dimensions? Do we have to have a whole other tutorial on going to three dimensions? Nah, three dimensions is the same as two. It's just another set of equations. It's the same set of equations, right? The three usual equations, just put a sub z in all the variables, and you've got equations of motion in three dimensions. So really, we've solved the whole story for constant acceleration. Where are we headed? Well, we know everything there is to know basically about motion in two and three dimensions with constant acceleration. We could still ask some interesting kinematics questions like, what about objects that run around in circles? If you're running around in a circle, that's going to turn out not to be constant acceleration, but it is something that we can understand. That's one place we got to go. And finally, the big place, right? What's physics really heading, uh, heading towards is why? We've been discussing what's the motion. I'd like to know why do objects move the way they do. We'll get there.